so um, first off, thanks for having me. It's, um, it's actually really exciting to present my work um, in a kind of different way than I usually do. And I haven't been able to do some of the things I like about it the most in the last two years. So it's been nice to remember all the reasons I got excited about what I do. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about my job as a geologist and what I study. So specifically, I'd like to tell you um, a little bit about how a really catastrophic glaciation shaped our planet as we know it today. So first off, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in West Virginia. So the entire state of West Virginia is in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and therefore, it's called the Mountain State. Um, I grew up spending a lot of time outside. So I grew up fishing um, near, near this waterfall. Um, I also grew up uh, uh, spending time in the mountains and rock climbing. So this is this amazing fin of rock is called Seneca Rocks, where I learned to climb. Um, and then I went to Colorado for college. And Colorado is not completely covered in mountains. Only half of it is. But the mountains are much bigger. And I continued to climb. Um, here, this is a picture of me climbing in Rocky Mountain National Park. And so you can tell that I enjoyed being outside and climbing rocks. And uh, when I started college, I thought I was going to study biology or maybe English. Um, but I had friends and family and people encourage me to take a, a class in geology. So who can tell me what geology is? Is this something you're all familiar with? Rocks, study of rocks, study of rocks, rock science. Yeah, cool, exactly. So broadly speaking, geology is the study of our planet, but it's often done by studying rocks. And um, I, I think a lot about rocks. And, um, you know, when I, when, when people recommended I take a geology class, I actually thought it would be quite boring, even though I like spending time outside, rocks didn't seem particularly interesting. But in my first class, my teacher took us to the Grand Canyon. And uh, this is a really spectacular place. And if any of you get the opportunity to visit, I really recommend going. And especially if you have a chance to go down into the Grand Canyon, uh, it's a really spectacular experience. So on this field trip, we went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and I was really amazed at what my teacher was able to see by looking at the rocks. Okay, so here's a picture of um, a mountain near the Grand Canyon. And who can tell me what they see? Just you know, throw something out there, what do you see? Layers, I like that. Sedimentary rock, oh boy, you guys are way advanced. Okay, yeah, good, red red rocks, that's important. Somebody already knows stratification. Okay, yeah, so if you look at this picture, you can see, see there's these layers here, here's some other layers. And um, these layers are what are called strata. Somebody in the chat mentioned stratification. So. Strata are these um, layers of rocks. And one thing that's important to know about them is they're always formed horizontally and they're formed by stacking one on top of the other. So we know that the, the ones at the bottom are older and the ones at the top are younger. And so in this picture, um, when I look at this photo, I can actually see um, reconstruct a series of events. So we can see that these green layers, these green strata are at an angle relative to these white layers. So that means um, the green layers were deposited flat. There was some big event that tilted the layers. And then there's a surface where the next layers stacked on top of those um, flat. So this, this transition here might be some sort of big tectonic collision or something. And so um, within geology, I study stratigraphy and you can think about this as um, like studying strata like you're reading the pages of earth's history so these layers um, reveal uh, they reveal things that we can learn about that happened in our planet's past okay so uh, now that i've given you sort of an intro to myself and how i got interested in this work um, the rest of the talk um, 
here's some of the things I'd like you to learn from. So first, what exactly do I do? What does a geologist do? Um, Second, I'd like to give you a glimpse into the time scales I think about. So the geological time scale. Third, I wanna tell you about uh, this very catastrophic uh, global glaciation we call Snowball Earth. And last, I'd like to show you how it shaped our planet as we know it. Okay, so first, what does a geologist do exactly? So um, this is the part of my job I love the most. Um, and so in the summers, I work in places like this in the Yukon in, the Yukon in Canada. So these spectacular mountains um, are more or less what I'm studying. All right, so this is a map of the earth. Can anyone tell me what kind of map this is? What we are looking at exactly here? So somebody says north. Yes, I like north, the top of the earth. Yes, the North Pole. Okay, so if I add a few things to this map, it might become more clear. Okay, so this is the North Pole. So this is a map of the earth looking straight down on the North Pole. And if we add a few more landmarks, this is Canada over here, Russia over here, um, Greenland, Europe is down here. So um maybe you can now get a sense so i think about the earth a lot from this perspective but it's not a perspective you see on many maps so i am fortunate to do a lot of my research throughout the arctic so i've worked in alaska and canada this island called svalbard some in siberia um, and i go to these remote places to understand the vast history of the rocks that are preserved there and these are often exposed in mountains and um one of the reasons I work in the Arctic is they're really poorly studied. These areas still have a lot of kind of major discus discoveries potentially to, to be uncovered. Okay, so my work starts by doing field work. Um, and because these are really remote places, there's no roads, uh, there's not a whole lot um, of anything developed up there. And so I often, to get around, I, I work from a helicopter and so, this is sometimes what my commute looks like on a very lucky day. Uh, I've also worked from sailboats, which is very nice. Um, so um, the other cool thing about working in the Arctic is you get to see crazy animals. Um, so I've seen some polar bears, luckily safely uh, from a safe distance on the boat. Um, and also these little miniature reindeer, which are really cute. Okay. so. Uh, I go to these remote areas and what am I doing up there specifically? So I'm, I'm looking at the rocks. So I study rocks, I study strata, the, these layers of rocks. And what I'm looking to do is when I look at in, uh, a particular rock, I'm trying to understand when and how it formed. So if we start in this upper left-hand picture here, um, this uh, sort of green wedge, this shape, this is actually an ancient river channel that got filled with sand. So if I see this, I can see that, okay, this was formed in an area with rivers. Um, this might look familiar to some of you. These are ancient ripples. So this feature here um, look a lot like ripples you might see at a beach today, but they've just been turned into rock. And so these tell me that uh, the rocks were deposited on a beach. And then these here are mud cracks. So these are from uh, a body of water that dried up. Um, that you might get um, in like a tidal environment during low tide. So I can look at the rocks and I try to understand the environments. I also go and collect samples with a hammer and put the rocks in a bag and I bring them back to my lab and I study them to try to understand uh, their chemistry. That gives me more information about the environment they're formed in and also to try to figure out how old they are. And then with all of this information, from what I learned in the field looking at the rocks and what I can learn from the lab, um, I piece together events that have happened in Earth's history. And ultimately, the reason I'm interested in all of this is really to help understand our planet today. So one really cool thing about my work is um, when you think about major changes and events in Earth's history, we can see that 
almost everything involves interactions between all of Earth's systems. So when I say Earth systems, I'm thinking of the, the climate and biology, geological processes like tectonics and the environment. And so all of these things work in concert to sort of create the planet we live on today. And then finally, one thing I really like about my work um, and I feel really fortunate about is that I get to work from, with people from all over the world. So I've worked with geologists uh, from Canada, Russia, Argentina, India, Mongolia, all over the place. Um, and it's a really cool aspect of this work. Okay, so that's sort of uh, my process for, for my work. And now uh, I'd like to transition to thinking a little bit about time. So geologists think about time in ways that are very different than a lot of people. Okay, so instead of thinking about minutes or seconds or days or years, um, I think about time on you know hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years or more. Okay, so this is sort of the official timeline of uh, Earth, um, but I think it's easier to conceptualize if we pretend like we're playing a board game. Okay, so this is the end of the board game. Let's say this is today. And if we trace it all the way back early, Earth is towards this side, right? Okay, so some of the most important things we think about happening on Earth, some things you may be familiar with. The last ice age was about 15,000 years ago. This is the last glaciation. Modern humans evolved sometime around 300,000 years ago. And then the very first primates that we evolved from evolved 65 million years ago. So this is not to scale, but it just gives you a kind of general sense. Some of you may know when dinosaurs existed, they were around from about 230 to 65 million years ago. Amphibians, 365 million years ago. And the earliest fish lived uh, first around 460 million years ago. So the very first animals um, was something like a sponge. And we see evidence for them around 600 million years ago. Okay, so that brings us back to this graph here. So that's sort of some of the evolution we're familiar with on Earth. Now, how old is the Earth itself? Does anyone have any idea how old our planet is? We actually know this quite well. Okay, Ahmad says 4.3 billion years, 4.5. Wow, yes, you are all great. That's, uh, yeah. Very accurate. So the, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. So we'll say 4.5 billion years old. That's right. So um, all of the things I just told you about, all of the evolution we think about um, uh, on this time scale. So this is four and a half billion years ago, 3 billion, 2 billion, 1 billion. Everything I told you about happened right at the very end here. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, that means uh, it's very compressed when we think about the entire, the entire history of Earth, right? Okay, next, how old is the oldest life on Earth? So I said the oldest animals were about 600 million years old. The animals are actually somewhat complex. So does anyone know when the earliest life evolved? Okay, somebody says 2 billion, 4 billion. These are really, Archean, okay, somebody, yeah. So life evolved really early in our planet's history. We know for sure that life was around at least by three billion years ago, most likely older. Um, and so this first life was really, really basic single cellular things like bacteria. And that means for most of earth history, the only things that were alive were bacteria, sing, sing, uh, single cellular organisms, things you can only see with a microscope, okay? So um, what I'm gonna talk about next is something that happens right around here. Um, and uh, it happens to have taken place sort of right before we see all this major evolution. Okay, so what if I told you that at one point in time, our planet was covered in ice completely, not just the poles like we have today, not just the highest mountains, but all the oceans, all pieces of land everywhere. Well, this is actually something that we're pretty sure happened uh, 700 million years ago. And so this, uh, 
this uh, event we call Snowball Earth. We think of it as a snowball because it looks like a snowball because it's a big pile of uh, snow, as uh, Josie told us uh, the, the details, the difference between snow and, and hail. So, okay, so, you know, I've told you exactly how some of the tools I have to understand the environment in Earth's geological record. So here's a picture of a glacier that's uh, uh, melted fairly recently. And so the glacier you can see used to come out to where these yellow outlines are. And as it's retreated, it's left this big pile of rocks and boulders and a big jumble. So this is sort of one piece um, that we can use for evidence of a past glaciation. This is evidence for a more recent glaciation. Um, we can also, so, and then if we look at the geological record, that might look like this big jumble of rocks. Um, other pieces of evidence we see for glaciation are these, uh, what we call striations. So these rocks and this, this surface here is scraped. So as glaciers move, um, as they flow and retreat, they scrape rocks against each other and you get these um, really flat surfaces with scrape marks. Um, you also get these things called drop stones. So this is a really cool feature. Um, and so I'll show you how they form here in this next slide. So um, glaciers um, are made of ice and ice actually flows like a liquid, but much slower. But because it flows, it is really good at tearing up the earth and ripping up rocks and moving them around. And so you can see here, ice in glaciers is actually often full of rock. And if that uh, turns into an iceberg, so this is a glacier, and as it reaches the ocean, if it, if it uh, breaks off and turns into an iceberg, those rocks can melt out and fall into the deep ocean. And so what we're looking at here is these orange and black layers are strata that used to be horizontal, and these are from the deep ocean. And then all of a sudden you see this, uh, what we call a pebble or a cobble, fall and we can see that it hit the bottom of the uh, the ocean and it actually indented the, the surface here. And so this is a drop stone and the only way you can get a pebble like this out in, it, in the deep uh, ocean is if a glacier floated out there. So with all of these different forms of evidence for glaciers, um, we actually see evidence for glaciation like this uh, for this particular time period that's 700 million years old in every continent on, our, on Earth. So all of these orange dots are evidence for a, this past glaciation. So we see them all over the place. So there's one complicating factor, which is that uh, Earth's continents didn't look like this 700 million years ago. This is actually what Earth's continents look like. So uh, this Laurentia is the, the fancy geologic name for the continent I live on uh, in North America. And uh, Laurentia was at the equator and um, luckily, we actually have tools for reconstructing how the uh, 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 continents were configured in the past. And when we see all that evidence, we actually see that there's evidence for glaciations at the ocean, so at sea level, in the tropics. So that should be the warmest place on Earth at any given time. Um, so if that place is frozen, that means there should have been ice everywhere. So this is one piece of evidence that the places that we expect to be the warmest are actually covered with ice. This is evidence that the whole planet was covered with ice. Okay, so I wanna think about how the earth got into this state. And so we're gonna go into breakout rooms now and do a short little activity. Okay, so how did this happen? So what we just all kind of learned about in the um, in the breakout room is something called the albedo effect. Okay, so the albedo effect is something that it sounds like most of you are already sort of intuitively familiar with um, just from living life on our planet. And um, so if we put it into scientific terms, it's just the uh, ability for a surface to either reflect sunlight or absorb sunlight. Okay, so Things that uh, reflect sunlight uh, do a better job at um, staying cool, whereas things that absorb sunlight uh, absorb the energy from the sun more and therefore they warm up. Okay, so why are we talking about walking on walking around uh, barefoot in the summer? 
Um, oops. Did you? Okay, so um, this this example, um, this is actually an example of the different stages of the snowball Earth um, sort of progression and how it how it happened. And so in this picture, the light blue are glaciers, the dark blue are oceans. And so this first picture is something more similar to what we have on Earth today, where we have glaciers at the ice caps. Okay. Um, somebody in my group had a very good question, which is where did the ice come from to create snowball Earth? Um, the uh, most of Earth history, there's been no ice on on Earth whatsoever. Um, there's uh, a lot more time when there is ice, it's only on the poles. However, because ice reflects sunlight so much more because of its um, reflective properties, so in this case, it's akin to the concrete, if you get enough ice cover, so the planet would be cooling as you move to these, to these next states, and it's, it begins reflecting so much sunlight that um, nothing else has to happen, but if you reach a certain point where there's enough ice covering the globe, it's um, inevitable that the planet will cool and the entire globe will become covered in ice. And so this is something that, uh, this is a feedback where the more ice that grows, the cooler the planet gets because it's re uh, reflecting more light. So where did the ice come from originally? Well, it came from uh, some changes in the greenhouse gases on Earth. And so um, the greenhouse effect, uh, as some of you probably know, is uh, the ability for certain chemicals like CO2 and methane and water vapor to sort of insulate Earth and uh, retain the heat that the sun provides us. Um, so with less greenhouse gases, the planet cools off and we can get bigger uh, glaciers. So we can think about the start of snowball glaciation as sort of the opposite of what's going on today. So the ice is growing. So as the ice starts growing, um, then the albedo effect takes place. So this animation I'm showing you is actually what's happening on Earth today. So as these glaciers recede, there's less ice to reflect the sunlight and therefore the ocean is absorbing more and more energy from the sun. And so even with no changes in the greenhouse, the change in the amount of ice is actually gonna warm the planet through, through its uh, effect in the, uh, through the albedo effect. Okay, so um, these processes together, um, uh, the, the ice had to form originally because the planet cooled because of a decreased greenhouse effect. And then the progression from these different states actually um, can, the, the planet can cool simply by ice covering more of it and therefore reflecting more sunlight. Um, and this is what we call a positive feedback effect, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, so we have good evidence that the whole planet was covered in ice 700 million years ago. Now, if we look back at our geological time scale, um, we said life evolved at least by 3 billion years ago, right? And then all of the interesting evolution with the cool animals leading to us happened in the last you know, half a billion years. And so um, uh, everything that is alive today is related to these early organisms. That means everything that is alive today is related to something that survived the snowball earth glaciation. Okay, so all of us are related to something that somehow survived this, uh, this sort of catastrophic uh, uh, snowball. And so um, the timing of this might seem curious also. So these, uh, the snowball glaciation occurred right before all of this evolution. Um, so this is some of the sort of small environments we think uh, organisms could have survived. So ice um, does melt even if the planet's cold and um, there's algae that grows on glaciers. And um, we think that these sort of refu refugia are places where some early uh, life survived. And then after the glaciers receded, we start to see some of the first sort of multicellular organisms. These are still really small, but they're um, becoming more complex. And so we actually think that the earliest life evolved um, as a direct result of this snowball glaciation. And therefore, we all have this uh, sort of uh, snowball event 
to thank for all of the wonderful life we see on our planet today. Um, and so uh, it is a kind of a cool thing to, to, you know, I was originally interested in biology a little bit and my work now deals with the relationships with, between these uh, really big, big things that affected our planets that affected both the geological and biological side. And so with that, um, like to thank you again. Really appreciate everyone showing up tonight. What we have over a hundred people. That's really cool. Sounds like from all over the world too. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi Tim. Thanks so much for such a wonderful talk today. Um, I got to learn a lot about um, snowball Earth and ocean Earth as well. And um, I know everyone, at least in my breakout room, also had a great time learning about it. Um, so throughout the talk, we've been collecting questions from the audience and feel free to keep putting questions in the chat, um, but I'll ask you a couple questions now. Great. Um, so one question we just got was, um, how did the planet warm up again after becoming covered in ice? I'm really glad somebody answered, asked this question. Um, so uh, the, um, the climate we think of largely as being controlled by greenhouse gases. Um, so I told you about the albedo effect that has a, a small effect, but you're right. Once the planet is covered with ice, the albedo effect is so strong that it's actually really hard to get out of. And there's a lot of planets that we think um, got uh, became covered in ice and never escaped essentially. Um, and this is where uh, uh, some, some geology comes into play. So the greenhouse gases on earth we experience today, um, we can think of, uh, you know, there's a human input, which is quite large. There's also natural inputs that are um, pretty much continuous through time. And so things like um, volcanoes and, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, mid-ocean ridges spreading, they're constantly releasing very small amounts of greenhouse gases. And um, compared to what we release, it's very small, but geological time happens over a really long period. So if you give them many, many millions of years, the greenhouse gases are going to build up high enough that um, we think they actually were something like 10,000 times higher concentrations than we see today. And it eventually led to the, the ice melting and immediately one of the hottest periods in all of Earth's history. Um, so it's a really complex interplay um, of, uh, of the carbon cycle. Um, so yeah, it's essentially volcanoes slowly seeped out enough greenhouse gases to warm the planet back up and saved us all. Um, and I guess um, right at that same period you're just talking about, we had another question um, about kind of why the rate of process, why the rate of progress of evolution was so much faster and kind of like sudden um, during that kind of rosic period? Yeah. So one thing I didn't talk about today um, is oxygen. So we all need oxygen. Animals need oxygen. Um, and uh, oxygen is a really useful energy source. However, oxygen was totally absent on the early Earth. And so um, oxygen levels um, only rose sometime sort of uh, shortly after Snowball Earth, high enough to levels where animals could survive. And so we think there's a direct relationship between the levels of oxygen and sort of the rate of evolution. Interesting. Um, we had another question um, um, kind of related to um, predictions um, and, and your work. So um, if the snowball effect made the ice age and you can see that through the rock layers, can the rock layers help predict climate change? Like, is there anything you can see now? That's a really good question. Um, so I, I, so I talked about how I think about things on very different scales. So when I think about um, climate change, I think about climate change on time scales on the order of millions of years. And so um, when I think about a planet 
warming up and cooling down, I think about it changing over time scales that are, you know, longer than humans have ever existed. So um, there are a few events in Earth's history that can give us clues about what um, we're experiencing currently. And um, there's no great analogy. So um, the best thing that my work and studying ancient rocks can tell us are some of the fundamentals about the, how the earth system work. And then we use that information or not I, but people who study the climate use that information to model much, much faster, shorter scale uh, changes in earth's climate. And so in that sense, they can use the information we understand of the earth to model the climate, to understand what's gonna happen in the next five or 10 or hundreds of years. Okay, and then um, um, kind of a uh, another question about Snowball Earth. Just for some clarification, is Snowball Earth the same thing as an ice age? So Snowball Earth um, is an ice age, but it is the most catastrophic ice age there ever was. So when when most of us think of an ice age, we think of the last ice age, which ended fifteen thousand. 10,000 years ago. And um, even though we think of the ice age as there being ice everywhere, ice did not cover the entire planet. So it extended down, you know, I live in Connecticut, the ice came down pretty much down to here. And if you go further south, you were beyond the ice. So um, the snowball earth was an ice age, but most ice ages were not the entire planet. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that makes sense. Um, that makes sense to me. Um, a uh, another question um, that we got, kind of related to the climate of the Earth, is about the Earth's um, humidity. And um, um, they mentioned that the Earth Earth was really humid, um, you know, like a billion years ago. And why was that? Um, I guess uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by that. Um... Uh, so humidity refers to water vapor. Yeah, the um, the uh, yeah. I don't know that I don't know that Earth was more humid a billion years ago. The atmosphere was very different, and that's very that's really interesting. Um, I think one remarkable thing about Earth that people don't appreciate is for life to live on Earth. There's actually a really narrow range of conditions that to us seem extreme, but between the boiling point and freezing point of water, more or less, we have evidence that there's been, uh, you know, that's 100 degrees Celsius. And if we look at all the planets in the entire universe, that's a really narrow range for a planet to stay. And we have evidence that there's places on Earth that have stayed between those temperatures to allow for some liquid water for 4 billion years. So. That's pretty incredible. Um, and um, another question that we got um, is, so you think a lot about the past, um, you know, um, catastrophic, um, you know, snowball earth. Um, do you think that it could happen in our future? And if it did happen in our lifetimes, what could we do? Um, what could we do about it? Would we have any power? Mm, this is a very good question. Um, I don't know anyone who studies this that thinks this is possible to happen again in our future, or at least something very drastic would have to happen. Um, so um, the Earth's climate has continued to change for, you know, it's all of our planet's history, but this has only happened kind of twice ever. And um, one thing that's really important is that it's driven by greenhouse gases and greenhouse gases are made up of carbon. And so there's a big carbon cycle in Earth's uh, uh, sort of between the life on Earth and the greenhouse gases and the carbon in the ocean. And most people think that now that we have so much carbon in living organisms, that stabilizes the environment much more and it would be much harder to actually get into a snowball earth state. So I don't think it's something um, we need to worry about. I haven't thought about what we would do about it. I don't, yeah, I feel like our dealing with our current climate change is enough to keep us occupied. So I'd have to think about that more. 
Um, okay, and then one last question. Um, a lot of students were um, interested in the chat um, about um, what you do. So how did you really get to become a geologist? Um, like, what would you do um, at their age to, if you if you were really interested in um, your presentation? Yeah, I like that question a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, I told you all the coolest, flashiest, most fun parts about my job, which I got to do for about six or eight weeks a year when I can travel. Um, the rest of the time, I'm uh, in the lab doing chemistry. Uh, or writing papers. So if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, sort of a foundation in um, the physical sciences is a really good place to start. That's sort of a strong foundation in chemistry. I like chemistry a lot, um, which I can't believe, I never would have believed I would be saying that 20 years ago. Um, so I would say uh, having an interest in the natural world, you know, I'm interested in why things are the way they are around us. You know, I look at East Rock uh, from my office here and there's a whole complex geological history of that mountain that's really interesting. Um, so I'd say be interested. And um, yeah, I think a lot of colleges have geology programs. So if you're interested in that, um, you can investigate which one might be a good fit. Great, thank you so much, Tim, again, for such an amazing um, presentation. Um, and I'll hand it over to one of our other volunteers to close up this uh, close up this session.